<laughs> so compact bone. Um, the compact bone, we're going to talk about it from the perspective of the osteon. So that's why I have this picture up here. You should recognize this as a micrograph. And hopefully, hopefully you can begin to recognize and identify some of the structures here, like the herversian or the central canal, and the lamellae, and the lacunae, and the cannuliculi, and the whole thing is an osteon. Okay, so we take, this is just a single osteon that we can see here. If we take osteons and begin to stack them together, we begin to generate this thing known as compact bone. So really, when we look at compact bone, what it comes down to is that compact bone is a single osteon, or made up of single osteons, surrounding that central canal, Looks like a two-year-old just wrote this. Central canal. That's not an H. That's an N. I'm four years old. <laughs> <laughs> so the compact bone. <laughs> it's <laughs> <laughs> Single osteons surround the central canal, and you'd have many osteons that compacted or compacted together or really tightly packed together to form compact bone. So multiple osteons plus their central central canals form a compact bone. Now, the central canal is basically an avenue or a conduit for nerves and blood supply. So you'd have nutrient foramen that brings in the vessel, and then the vessels distribute through the central canals of a variety of different areas or locations. And then they permeate smaller capillaries into this surrounding tissue to interact with the individual cells. So from the central canal, the central canals are connected by perforating canals. To allow that blood supply into the bone tissue itself or into the extracellular matrix. So the central canal and the perforating canals, the connected perforating canals, are going to carry nerve supply and vessels, blood vessels. Are the perforating canals the mineralized breaking region? No, because the mineralization makes it extra strong, and so we can actually support these small little tiny canals. It's basically enough room for a capillary to slip through. So it's not like it's just this big gouge through the middle of the bone. It's yeah. very, very microscopic. Now, the osteon itself, and you can see that illustrated here very well, has these, uh, these concentric rings that we call lamellae. And each of these lamellae is wrapped in collagen fibers and it becomes so you would have collagen fibers that wrap within each of these lamellae and it becomes really important because those collagen fibers wrapped around each layer of lamellae acts like a screw so it acts like a screw and literally each of these is sort of going to be twisted into the next layer. And it becomes even stronger. It's a really nice design. You can refer to that as the osteon screw. It looks something like this. And you'll notice that we actually go in different directions as we build this osteon out. And so we have resistance to twisting forces. <laughs> Did someone just throw that at me? Who just, just kidding. It sounded like someone was, what is that? <laughs> I 
I'm going to be sitting up here and I'm just giving a huge spitball. <laughs> right, you've digressed enough. So the collagen oriented in two different ways. It, they they re allow resistance to sort of a twisting motion, making it even stronger. So each layer of, layer of the osteon spirals in a different Direction. Kind of like a barrel of that. It's like there's just one in the Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Why are you thinking about guns? This is anatomy and physiology class. Well, and yeah, and you're yeah. like, yeah, it's like, I yeah, shot this guy this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it looks like a gun. My bones are like guns. <laughs> I'll show you the gun show. <laughs> <laughs> what it's really like is screw that's drilled into a screw that's drilled into a bigger screw and so on and so forth, except for they drill in in opposite directions. One's counterclockwise, one's clockwise. One's counterclockwise, the other one's clockwise. I'm kind of scared right now. Okay, so that's the compact bone. What about the spongy bone and the marrow? Uh, again, we've already identified that spongy bone and marrow, uh, and we're going to see osteons there as well. It's going to be the individual osteon making up the trabiculae. The spongy bone is going to be hardened bone tissue. And so in name, spongy is only what it looks like. So a spongy bone is spongy because it's of the appearance. It's really very hardened tissue. So if we were to dissect a, a bone or cut a bone in half, you couldn't just like sponge around in that spongy bone. It'd be very, very hard to touch. It's only the, the appearance. It only looks like a sponge. It's very hard tissue itself. So just kind of trying to set the stage here that we're not dealing with a very, we're not dealing with you know, compact is hard bone, spongy bone is soft. <clears throat> they're both very hard because they're both calcified. And they both have the minerals deposited on their, uh, on their collagen fibers. So spongy bone, to get that spongy appearance, it consists of thin network a thin network um, that we call the, the each piece of the, of the network. So if you consider this a piece of the network and then this is a piece of the network, here's another piece and here's a couple other pieces. Those pieces of the network are called trabeculae. And it's not illustrated here, but what we would find on the trabeculae is there's actually little tiny protrusions, little spikes that come off of each of those, each of those braces. And those are spicules. And so these will protrude off of the trabeculae. And ultimately, those are going to provide attachment and, and structural support for the marrow itself. Uh, but the, the, what I'm describing here in this network with trabeculae and the spic spicules is we end up with a large amount of space. You know, we have all of these little tiny spaces in here within our spongy bone. So we get this 
production of space, and it's in that space of the bun spongy bone where we are going to find our marrow. So spaces are occupied by bone marrow. And we're going to find that there are two types of bone marrow that can be present within these spaces of the bone tissue. Now, you're looking at uh, just a cross-sectional example of a bone basically cut out a chunk, and you're going to be able to identify uh, two different types of bone marrow. Bone marrow that appears sort of yellow. It's, it's not real clear in this picture, but if you get up real close, this has a sort of yellow appearance. It's very obvious that this has a very red appearance. So we're going to have two types, red marrow and yellow marrow. The red marrow produces our blood cells. And it's producing red blood cells that have a red appearance, so the red marrow has its red appearance. Uh, this is very prevalent in kids. And part of that is because children are turning over their blood supply a lot more frequently than in adults. Uh, in adults, because we don't have to turn over the blood supply as much, we're going to find that blood, uh, red marrow, the blood producing red marrow in primarily the flat bones. What is a blones? You're going to find it in the flat bones. <laughs> the flat bones, and then also in the head of the femur, the big leg and the bone, and the humerus, the big leg and the arm. What? I have no clue what we're laughing at. I don't know. Why not? There might be black on that ear. Don't hear. Yeah. Well, it's not. What are you laughing at? <laughs> Why are you laughing at me? <laughs> Whatever. Remember, I grade you. <laughs> Yellow marrow, on the other hand, is going to be more of a fatty tissue. <laughs> and it's no longer <laughs> no longer producing blood. So how do we actually get yellow marrow. Red marrow obviously very prevalent in children and as you age this becomes more prevalent. It's very prevalent in adults and it arises because some of our red marrow just simply becomes more fatty. The tissue gets uh, higher levels of adipocytes and turns more yellow as you age. It's just a process, a natural process of the biology of aging. What happens when you have, like, um, bone cancer or something? Which marrow is affected? Is it the red or the yellow? Does it depend on the age or the time? Or how does that work? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> um, I have a friend that's it's a great that question. Day, so I just don't want to my guess is that it's probably red marrow that they get concerned about since that actually is producing mm -hmm. tissue. Yellow marrow, um, it's fat. Uh -huh. So um, if bone cancer affects the marrow and the marrow cavity, they might get a little bit concerned about red blood cells being produced in a, in a high enough quantity. A 
Okay, so let's begin to talk here about bone development. Another term for bone development is osteogenesis. Yes, and osteogenesis occurs in two ways. And the two ways are going to be dependent on the bone type. So bone type dependent. The two ways are going to be intramembranous ossification and endochondrial ossification. We're going to start out with intramembranous ossification. That's a long one. It's a huge one. So for starters, the intramembranous ossification is the type of bone development that we'd find for the skull and the clavicle. So the skull, the bones of the skull, and then your collarbone or your clavicle. Okay, so one of our primordial embryonic tissues, and we hit on this briefly, was a tissue that was called mesenchyme. Mesenchyme begins to form, this is just an embryonic tissue, and it begins to stratify, or mesenchyme begins to layer. Now as the mesenchyme, you can see here we have the mesenchyme cells, and they begin to form this layering effect. And what that is doing is it is forming initially <coughs> forms trabeculae, or what we would recognize in the adult as trabeculae. Now, we're going to bring in a blood supply. That should be fed. So we're going to fed, uh, this is going to be fed by capillaries, and as this tissue is fed by capillaries, that blood supply is going to begin to provide some new cells. One of the new cells that's going to be provided will be stem cells. And you've probably already guessed that these are going to be those osteogenic or osteoprogenitor cells. So they begin to influx into this stratifying mesenchyme. So we begin to have the stratification that occurs in the mesenchymal tissue, and the blood supply comes in, and now we begin to deposit osteogenitor cells, osteoprogenitor cells, or osteogenic cells. So these stem cells come in, and they undergo a differentiation process. To form osteoblasts. Now, why should that not surprise you? And what do osteoblasts do? They are bone builders. So the stem cells differentiate to bone building cells called osteoblasts. Now, one of the ways that osteoblasts begin to generate bone tissue is they begin to secrete this substance called <coughs> osteoid. So we begin to deposit from our osteoblasts osteoid. And that osteoid begins to um, get laid down over the tissue. and provides calcium phosphate, or provides the ability for calcium phosphate to begin to be collected. This also known as hydroxyapatite, this is minerals. Anytime you hear minerals in reference to bone, you've got to be thinking, okay, we're beginning to harden that tissue. 
So those osteoblasts come in, lay down osteoid. This allows calcium phosphate to begin to collect. The bone tissue begins to harden, and some of those osteoblasts are going to be trapped. Trapped. So when we trap those osteoblasts, they now further differentiate into osteocytes. Okay, and that's what you can see happening here. We basically have our osteoblasts that come in in the stratification, collagen fibers and everything. This is what we would call the ossification center. This is where bones actually beginning to develop. Osteoid begins to be deposited by those osteoblasts. Now, some of those osteoblasts are beginning to be trapped within that hardening tissue where we have calcification happening. They are now osteocytes trapped inside of those little tiny lacunae. Wow. That was supposed to be a six. At the periphery of the mesenchyme, so out here along the outer edge of this forming structure, we form our primordial periosteum. So we begin to wrap it up in this collagenous tissue, this um, collagen-containing tissue. Osteoclasts now begin to remodel. So the osteoclast, osteoblast, a boner, uh, is a boner. <laughs> <laughs> We're not even talking about reproductive systems. <laughs> <laughs> what I was trying to say was a bone builder. Are you recording? <laughs> and I'm leaving it. <laughs> so the osteoclast, am I turning a little bit red? I'm just trying to show you from last week what happens when you have a Increase in blood flow to the skin capillaries it changes your skin color. Actually, I don't really feel like that turned all that red because it doesn't really embarrass me that much. I'm a grumpy old man. Who cares? I mean, penis, whatever. <laughs> We're going to get there eventually. we got to talk about the reproductive system. <laughs> But before we get there, we got to finish the bone. So, some of the osteoclasts, which are bone breaker downers, I don't know if that's a real word or not, but they break down bone, and so they begin to remodel and basically reorganize some of these forming, forming trabiculae. I think the funniest part about all of this is like you all like sort of pause, like, can I laugh at that? <laughs> Is it true and appropriate if I already know what that is? <laughs> okay, so osteoclasts remodel some trabiculae, marrow cavity begins to form. They basically begin to rip away some of the trabiculae, reorganize it, and we end up with larger and larger spaces. And so we begin to form a marrow cavity. We also have osteoclast remodeling, especially for the outer trabiculae. And the process goes in the other direction. And what I mean by the process goes in the other direction is here we are making it more open, forming the marrow cavity. Here on the outer trabiculae, we're going to pack everything together and we're going to make it more compact.
Okay, so by the time this whole process is done, we're going to have areas where we have compact bone, areas where there's cavity, and then other areas where there's more compact bone, and we get that compact diplo complex sandwich structure that's very um, obvious in adult uh, flat bones, mm -hmm. like the skull and the sternum. Does everybody get it? All right, so our second type of oh. our second type of uh, bone development here is endochondrial ossification. And this is actually the way that most bones are going to begin to form, or most bones are going to form. Okay, so most bones So for most bones, we have growth that occurs from the epiphyseal plate. And so we're going to have to basically use this endochondrial ossification to form this epiphyseal plate for further elongation and growth. So again, working from the mesenchyme, this uh, embryonic tissue that will give rise to our bone tissue, initially we have production of a hyaline cartilage model or body. All right, so that's what you can see here. It starts out basically as this cartilaginous model, and it's just basically the production of what the bones are eventually going to look like. And you actually can see this very early on in ultrasound. Uh, you'll begin to see what look like tiny little individual isolated bones beginning to develop within the embryo. So those little bone models begin to develop, and they develop all over the individual. Now, the cells that make up the cartilaginous model are going to be chondrocytes. Those are just cartilage cells. And the, cart the chondrocytes are going to thicken the cartilage model and help to basically create a very robust model that can be, um, can be used to begin to produce the bone cells. By the way, we are going to have periosteum that surrounds the hyaline cartilage model, just sort of wraps around it. Okay, which is what you're basically seeing here. We have our cartilaginous model, and it would be wrapped up in periosteum. Now, at that periosteum, we're going to begin to have The periosteum in its form called perichondrium, which is really before it becomes completely bone. So this would be perichondrium up here, but eventually becomes periosteum. That perichondrium is going to be the site, the location, to begin to produce our bone building cells. Or osteoblasts. Most of you didn't notice that I emphasized getting it right at that time. So perichondrium begins producing our osteoblasts. Once we've produced osteoblasts, then really properly, we are now uh, 
periosteum. This initially begins towards the center of the bone model, that, that uh, highline cartilage model. And it starts out as a bone ring. So in the midsection, we have the periosteum that begins to produce uh, osteoblasts, and now we begin to form a bone ring. We begin to actually lay down some um, ossifying material, uh, calcifying material in the middle there. And we begin to refer to this part of the bone model as the primary ossification center. Okay, so the primary ossification center forms in the middle of the model. <clears throat> the chondrocytes are going to enlarge and then they die because basically there's a lack of nutrients. And as they die, towards the middle of this primary ossification center, we begin to have open spaces that form from the dying chondrocytes, the, the cells that were maintaining the cartilage. Not enough blood supply, so they die. And then we begin to have this cavity that forms. So our cavity begins to form, which is what you can begin to see as we transition from B to C here. We have the presence of that cavity. You also notice that there's additional compact bone that's being developed. So as that cavity forms, eventually we're going to refer to it as the primary marrow cavity. And this is what the cavity that forms at the primary ossification center, which I'm just going to refer to as the POC of the POC. Now, this primary marrow cavity is eventually going to begin to fill with blood vessels. And you can see blood supply coming in here and continuing here in the next picture. So, blood supply blood vessels, and even some stem cells begin to enter into that primary ossification center in that marrow cavity, primary marrow cavity. Uh, we also are now going to have osteoid tissue that gets laid down on the edge of the cavity. And this laydown of osteoid tissue occurs from the middle of the bone, so right in this area, and begins to work its way out in both directions, so from middle outward. We begin to add that osteoid tissue. So as we move on a little bit further, you can see that that primary ossification center, you get a well-developed cavity, uh, marrow cavity that begins to form. And towards the outer portions of the, of the bone, we actually have very little. It's still very, very much like a highline cartilage model or pieces of highline cartilage. But eventually we're going to begin to have, as more blood supply comes in and we, we see the changes with the marrow cavity, we're going to begin to see that tissue undergo development as well. So the diaphysis or the bone shaft is going to be well formed. 
and then we're going to begin to see by a very similar process of ossification and uh, trapping the cells and um, creating that osteoid tissue, new cavities forming at the ends of the bones. And it's going to occur in our long bones at both ends, and actually at one end in a couple different places. So cavities form at the ends of bones, and these cavities form a structure that we're going to refer to as the metaphysis. So does the cavity form or does the metaphysis form? So the cavity form at the end of the bone? Yeah. Well, the, the cavity forms, at the, so you have the diaphysis that forms, then you have cavities that form at the end of the bone, and we have this whole area where all of this is going on is referred to as the metaphysis. Now eventually, we're going to have a secondary ossification center, and I'm going to put them in as centers because we have multiple secondary ossification centers, and these are going to begin to form, and they're going to form even further out towards the ends, so we'll go diaphysis, metaphysis, and then at the very ends, those cavities, as they begin to form at the end of the bones, the epiphysis. Now, just like with our primary ossification center, we also have a secondary marrow cavity that forms in the secondary ossification center. And this expands in all directions. As the cavity forms, which you can see those cavities beginning to form here at our secondary ossification centers, we begin to have the diaphysis, the metaphysis, and then a little separation between those secondary cavities, which are eventually going to become the epiphyseal plates. Uh, in the epiphysis, it's going to be spongy bone that's forming. So spongy bone forms in the cavity, but it leaves, it doesn't expand into one portion of the, of the area at the end of the bone. And so we leave this remnant called the epiphyseal plate. And in all reality, this epiphyseal plate remains actually really, really active and it is going to accommodate our bone growth. And so that's what you can see here. This is basically where we've made it to. This would be the adult bone. So the bone goes through its modeling stages. You have those two different cavities that begin to form, the two different types of cavities. And so you're left over with a bone that has a marrow cavity and its blood supply in the diaphysis. And then at either end, you have the metaphysis. And then at the very ends, you have the epiphysis. And between the metaphysis and the epiph epiphysis, you have these areas that are known as epiphyseal plates. Or you may already know them as growth plates. So those growth plates are going to be regions for growth. And so as we go from picture E to picture F in this direction, the bone is now going to begin to elongate, and we're going to get additional bone to deposit. We've developed the bone, it's now going to begin to elongate in a process that's known as bone growth.
So bone growth is going to primarily occur as elongation at the epiphyseal plate. So there's a lot of stuff that's going to happen at the epiphyseal plate. So hopefully this picture helps to explain a little bit more detail here. Here is the diaphysis, the end of the diaphysis. Then we have this region between the diaphysis and the epiphyseal plate that's called the metiphysis. And then at the very end, we have the epiphysis. And in between metiphysis and epiphysis is the growth plate or the epiphyseal plate. Okay? Now, we can actually go in and you can see this would be immature and this would be mature. You can see that in the immature individual, that growth plate is much bigger. And that's because you have all of this expansion that's occurring in the adult and as you age, this epiphyseal plate becomes thinner and thinner and thinner because we're calcifying it, reducing the amount of growth that can occur so eventually it seals up completely. So we can actually go and take a look at what's happening at that epiphyseal plate. Uh, and, and they've done this uh, and looked at it under microscopic observation. And what we see when we get to that epiphyseal plate is three layers it's going to be hyaline cartilage sandwiched sandwiched by a metiphysis. Okay, so we're going to, I'm kind of thinking this is a little confusing, so let's maybe draw this out just a little bit. Okay, so we're going to have three layers. Two of the layers are going to be metiphysis like. And then a third layer, no, I'm sorry, hyaline cartilage like. Hyaline cartilage. And then a third layer in the middle is going to be metiphysis like. And within the metiphysis, within that third layer, we would find this structure here. Okay? This is a histological section through the epiphyseal plate. So the hyaline is on the outside, or the top and bottom, in the middle part? Yeah, so down here and then up here towards the resting cartilage. In fact, this is actually going to be part of the hyaline cartilage. Okay, so within the metiphysis, there are five zones of growth. And that's what you can see here. One, two, three, four, five. In those five zones of growth, we're going to have each of them referred to as the zone of something. Okay, so the first one is going to be the zone of reserve cartilage. Reserve cartilage. And this is just simply going to be a resting zone, uh, rest, resting hyaline cartilage. So zone of reserve cartilage, resting cartilage, resting hyaline cartilage, and that will be uh, here in the what's referred to as the resting zone on this figure. Then we're going to have the zone of cell proliferation. And just like its name suggests, we're actually going to have cartilage-containing cells, chondrocytes, and there's going to be multiple layers of chondrocytes in multiple rows of lacunae.
So the chondrocytes multiply, and we get these sort of rows of lacunae that move through that pro proliferation zone, and it's all by mitosis. So from our resting zone, we would have a row of chondrocytes that form, and then another row, and the, the rows just sort of push their way through this zone of proliferation until we get down here where those rows now begin to change. Does this make sense? What it says, um, after chondrocytes multiply, they move through the zone of proliferation. Lacunae rows are rows of lacunae, which are the, the sites of the chondrocytes. Remember, those are like the little caverns. Mm -hmm. They're the, the little caverns where the cell sits. Okay, so if I were to draw the proliferation zone or the zone of cell proliferation, okay, you would have this row that would begin to move in this direction. Okay, so then maybe the second row would be a bunch of red chondrocytes. That yellow row, the initial row, would move. It's just like away from water. It's just moving down. But as it's moving down, we're actually causing the bone to get longer. Maybe we'd have these special purple ones. And then the red ones would have moved down. So on and so forth. And we're actually moving the bone, elongating the bone in that direction. So now as these move out the bottom of that zone of proliferation, you can see here's a row coming out, right? And here's another row and another row and another row. And now the cells are beginning, they start out really small, and now they're beginning to get bigger. And so this will be the zone of cell hypertrophy. And the term hypertroph hypertrophy, hypertrophy literally means getting bigger in size. Okay, so that cell of hypertrophy, the chondrocytes that have moved their way out of the proliferation zone are going to undergo an enlarging process. And the walls that make up the lacunae that trap the, the chondrocytes, they're going to begin to thin out. They're going to begin to get thinner as those chondrocytes get bigger. So everything is moving down in this direction, or appears to be moving down in this direction, but in all reality, the zone of resting cartilage is moving and move, making its way upwards as the bone elongates. The walls that contain the lacunae that begins to thin out so that the cell can expand in size. And as these larger cells begin to descend or begin to move into this next zone, for, uh, the, the fourth zone, this will be the zone of calcification. The zone of calcification. And that zone of calcification is going to be exemplified by our temporary mineral deposit. So temporarily mineral deposition. And that's really what you can see here is these cells begin to kind of disappear and the tissue gets a little bit different in, in its, its coloration in the staining process. And that's because there's some temporary minerals that are being laid down. Okay? So we're not yet to a point where we've actually hardened the tissue enough. We're just kind of depositing those minerals. Now we're going to begin to have bone deposition, in the zone of bone deposition occur. And this is where we'll really get some good mineralization. We're going to have some bone cells that are present, such as osteoblasts that deposit the bone. And we start out forming trabiculae. Which really, when it comes down to it, trabiculae, T-R-A-B-A-C-U-L-A-E, trabiculae, no, this is actually an E, <laughs> trabiculae. They're really a trabiculae is just going to be an individual 
osteon, right? And then you pack additional trabeculae together and you get additional osteon to begin to form your compact bone. Or it can just stay as trabeculae and you continue to grow spongy bone. Thank <laughs> you.